about is Jerry Levinson. And uh, Jerry is going to speak today about understanding human suffering. <clears throat> I practiced as a psychologist for about 30 years. I'm now kind of retired. And uh, people who come into my office, people just like us, and they would appear just like we do, we're just fine. We're having a fine life. And within a very short time, often, the people who were sitting in front of me were wailing and crying and dealing with suffering, pain, for a variety of reasons, but underneath the veneer of everyone, there seems to be a pain. Everyone. Why would that be? What's it about? Why, why is there suffering? As many of you know, within Buddhism, that's one of the main first principles, that life is suffering. This is not Jerry's idea. <laughs> I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can. When we're born, we are, what we are is consciousness, infinite, eternal consciousness, beingness. And that beingness, that consciousness, enters into a physical form a mind-body organism, and that mind-body organism takes on the ownership of that awareness and says, I am, as Jerry is, this little baby is. I learned that I am a person, I am separate. We all learn that. It's a basic distortion in understanding that human beings seem to have to go through. We take ownership of a consciousness that is not our own. We make it personal. And we go through life, therefore, being separated from ourselves. Because I am not a limited body-mind organism. I am without limit. I am connected to everything and everyone. I am the source of everything. But I, my experience is I am this body-mind. Therefore, how do I feel as this body-mind? I feel empty, I feel afraid, I feel unbalanced, I feel something is missing, because something is missing. My identity, my beingness, the most important thing is missing. So what do I do? What do we all do? We try to fill up the emptiness. We seek for the answer for our suffering out there. Maybe if I have a new girlfriend, or if I make enough money, or if I take a drug, or if I have enough sex, or whatever. We all have our ways of seeking, but everybody who believes that they are a separate body-mind self has to be seeking. And as we can see here, hopefully, the seeking is endless and it's hopeless. Because what we are seeking for cannot be found. It is not out there. So courses like the Course of Miracles keep reminding us, seek not outside yourself. And we are all seeking outside ourselves. So clearly the answer to this suffering, if there is an answer, is to remember who we are. To notice that the body-mind organism that we think we are is just that, a thinking-feeling machine. And this thinking-feeling machine doesn't have an awareness. Awareness comes from somewhere else. Awareness is something that is, there's only one of it, and it appears through and has everything. So most of us spend our time watching our thoughts. We think we are our thoughts. Like this morning in our meditation or in any kind of, like right now, <laughs> we're listening to these words. and. Probably would think, oh, I hope I can find something in these words that will help me find this, em fill this emptiness that I have inside. And of course, it's not. It might, for a little while, it might say, oh, it might feel good. But whatever feels good will stop feeling good. That's another main principle of Buddhism and generality. Everything stops. If it will start, 
you can guarantee it will stop. So people have this illusion that I'm going to find happiness. Nobody finds happiness. It's impossible because if you find happiness, you will soon, it will move into something else. Everything changes. People think, I'm going to find enlightenment, I'm going to find peace. Nobody can find that. No person can be enlightened because enlightenment is the realization that there is no person. It's a very depressing thing to the ego, what I am saying. <laughs> <laughs> So as we sit here and notice our reactions to what I'm saying, take this moment and notice that you're noticing my voice, you're noticing your feelings and your reactions and thoughts about what I'm saying, and you're focusing on that. But really what, what's also going on is the part of you that is peacefully and totally accepting and aware of what is going on. You need awareness to be hearing what you're hearing. Your awareness is not the hearing. Your awareness is constant. The hearing comes and goes. The words come and go, but the awareness stays the same. You're having feelings. They only take place in your beingness, in your, in your present awareness. Now this present awareness is constant. It's all the time, it's all there is, and it's invisible to us because it is not an object. It has no definition. Our mind can't grasp it, our senses can't grasp it. What we are has no definition. It's, you might call it emptiness, some people call it that, or spaciousness, or, but certainly there's nothing you could ever touch or understand. What we are, what I am, cannot be understood by the mind because the mind is a little machine within this vast universe of consciousness. The little machine can never understand the vastness that we are. So most of us, we spend our time, again, looking through our mind, trying to find ourselves by study, by anything, by meditation. Meditation, you're focusing on your breath, you're focusing on not thinking, you're focusing on something. But what we are is before and beyond the focusing. It takes place already. So as soon as we start seeking, for what we are, we automatically lose because what we are is already present. How can it be, how can what I am be somewhere else? How can I have to learn something to be what I am? So it's all about learning to notice what we think we are and notice that it is causing our suffering. So how does it work? I developed this small, illusionary self that I call Jerry. And Jerry is an accumulation of all the things that he's learned and his biology, and all the traumas and whatever. It's a conditioning. And Jerry goes through the world seeking, right? He's seeking. He's, he's seeking close. He, he's totally separate and alone because of, he believes that he is. He's, he's afraid because he's not connected to anything or anyone. He feels like he's a separate thing. And he's, he's trying to find, you know. So what is he gonna try to do? He's gonna try to, whatever it would be, he's gonna, he's gonna try to be uh, smart. He's gonna try to be spiritual. And of course, just like all seeking, it is it fails. He finds that it doesn't work. He finds that he's still afraid. Because <laughs> whatever we try is going to fail sooner or later. There's nothing that can give us happiness in this world. Not a, and one of the reasons that more and more people are getting this is because for so long, people think, well, if I have enough money, if I have a better house, if I have a new car, if I have more clothes, then I'll be happy. People tend to put it on that. But now we're so affluent, particularly in Canada and North America, people are getting their car and their house and they're, and they're still coming to groups and they're still going to church and they're still frightened and they're still not enough and they're still seeking for the thing that they feel is lacking. 
and they still think it's outside. More money, more cars, more, more fame, more, 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 more. It, it's a hypnosis that humanity is entrapped by. So if I have this limited consciousness that I call Jerry, with those thoughts, then I'm going to go in the world and I'm going to try to find stuff. And if stuff doesn't happen, if I think I need a relationship to feel whole, and anyone, every, any separated self is going to feel like, oh, if I have a relationship, then I'll be whole. I'll, I'll ha I won't be alone anymore. But of course, that's another illusion. It doesn't work. Relationships do not work. They do not fill up the hole. So you have some, what do most people do? They get a divorce or they have a lover or whatever they do. They keep searching and searching and searching for the one. There isn't one. You goes, hate this story, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there is one, Jerry. There is one, <laughs> right. So, I'll tell you the good part. The good part is that the suffering when we suffer, it's like suffering is to consciousness as physical pain is to the body. If I put my hand in a fire and it burns, I pull it away and I say, oh my God, I learned something. I'm not going to go near that fire. And when I am suffering, I have the opportunity to say, why am I suffering? Where is this coming from? And the question that I ask myself is, for whom am I, for whom am I holding these feelings? For whom am I wanting these things? What, what in me needs this relationship? Who, who, who is the Jerry that is empty? I ask myself that question. And that's a question that is often asked in meditation or whatever. You try to find the you that is hurting, that is suffering, that is feeling, that is aware. It cannot be found. You haven't meditated for thousands of years, but the people who have, it's something you might want to accept on faith and on science, that there is no person behind our eyes and behind our ears. There's no separate person giving this talk right now. And there's no separate people out there listening to this. But it feels that way. The illusion of the ego is so intense. It's like if you imagine a mirage, if you're, if you're in the desert and you're thirsty, and you look up ahead and you see this mirage, this beautiful water there. It looks so real. You go close, whoa, you want to drink that. But if you try to take the water out of that mirage, there's nothing there. You can't change it, you can't alter it. But it looks so real. And that's what the ego feels like to all of us. It feels so real, but if you really go close, and that's what this is all about, you really got to go close and really ask yourself, who? is this that I think that I am? Who am I really? And even that is a waste of time because you're asking a question in your head and you're looking for something that you can't find because what we are can't be found or understood. What we are is already, already present. We right now are what we are. We are not separate. We are that which is watching. We are that which is aware of everything and connected to everyone. And as soon as there's an attempt to look for it, you're going away from it. The analogy is of the, there's a wave on the ocean. And the wave, as it comes up, is separate. It feels like, oh my god, I'm lost, I'm alone, I have to find, I have to find something. I have to find my center. So the wave looks all around, but the wave forgets that it is already connected to the ocean. It is already one with everything. But because of its illusion of separateness, it doesn't know it, and it suffers. So that is the cause of all suffering, because only a separate conditioned self has the judgments about the world that create suffering. The world, by the way, is out there, just as it is, perfect thing that it is, all the things that are happening. And if I didn't have this separated false self, 
I would just see that everything is just going. There's everything is just one. Right? It's just happening. And all these individual people imagining that they're separate, thinking that it's your life and you're choosing these things and these are your everything. It's really all just happening, right? So without without the contraction and conditioning of my ego mind, I will just see everything as it is. There's, there would be no reason for suffering because there'd be no judgment. In order for there to be suffering, there has to be a judgment that this shouldn't be happening, that this is wrong. Life should be different than it is. And only the ego mind would have that kind of a judgment because it's seeking something and it wants the world to be a certain way to get it. And if the world's go, not going that way, you judge it as, oh, this is, and so suffering can be defined as a resistance to what is. And liberation is oneness with acceptance of appreciation for what is, realizing that it couldn't be any different. It's just perfect. So nothing in the world can cause suffering unless we judge it that way. And the judgment comes from the small, illusionary self, and it's getting rid of that self or seeing past it. Like, when I speak or when you hear about these things, you can sort of get it or not get it. You can kind of, and I think all of us are ready to get it. That what we are is unlimited, and this unlimitedness is watching this being pretend that it's something else. It's like infinity pretending that it doesn't know itself. So, anybody want to ask anything or say anything or react to anything? Well, basically what you're saying is we are what we are. I am saying that. <laughs> <laughs> But we, are connected. All my we are what we are, but we are connected in, to the light. Yeah, in fact, we are the same. There's, there's one consciousness. And it, it, through this form, it, it calls itself Jerry. Through this form, it calls itself Katrina. But it's the same. The, the eye that it's seeing is the same eye that everybody's seeing through. We're all the same eye. But we distort it. We, 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 What's just happening, we take ownership of it. So this body starts moving around in the world, and I, and I say, well, this is my life, these are my choices. But in fact, there's no choices, and there's no person doing anything. It's all just happening. I don't know if you can get that. It's a total <laughs> reversal of the way the world sees things. The world sees things as we're individual people, and we make our choices, and we have free will, and, uh, and I have, um, have willpower, and I have these things, and I'm healed. All this stuff is my stuff. It's all about me. It's all about trying harder. It's all about, that's all bull. What's <laughs> happening is what's happening. There's no people there doing it. It's that illusion. Yes, you want to say something? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Ali, you want to say something? No. Okay. <laughs> this this guy just. Um, but aren't there cultures in the world <clears throat> that uh, raise their children in ways that are better than some of the Western ways, and, and you totally. know that 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 make this um, awareness come more easily? Totally. By the way, that's um, that's exact. I'm writing a book about. It's called New Paradigm Parenting. Um, and it's all about learning to treat children in a way and raise them in a way so that this transition is easier. There's many ways of doing that. And it, let me just give you the core of my understanding about that. Is when you have a child, what most parents do is they think they know better than the child and they tell the child essentially how they should be. And if the child's having certain feelings, the message to the child is, you shouldn't feel that way. You shouldn't think that way. In, in all sorts of ways within our culture, children are tried to be formed by their parents. And whenever a child or a person is forced to contract or change or be other than they naturally are, they create a barrier, a defense. 
And that defense gets harder and harder as you grow up, and it becomes what is called the ego, or the, or the small self. And that self is protected, and it, it's going to resist change. It's going to, it's going to feel that the world is attacking it, and it's going to close down, and it's, no, I'm right, and this is me. One sec. And if we allow our children, if we accept our children just the way they are, you can eat when you want, you can sleep when you want, you can learn what you want, you can go where you want, you can just be free. That child doesn't have to form a protection around its core. And that child will therefore be easy, have an easier time letting it go when they understand another, There's another recent theory about parenting that if the parent isn't the adult in the room and gives all this liberty and freedom of choice and being to this child, that it actually creates um, anxiety and not a sense of security in that child. That's the thing. Right, right, I know. And for me, the sense of security comes from the closeness and the loving contact with the parents, not mm -hmm. with how they're controlled or what they're allowed mm -hmm. to do. That's very secondary. So in my, my view, you have a, a parent that really respects and loves and honors this child, just like you would respect and honor your spouse or your partner, in the same way, exactly the same way. You treat the child with respect and honor, and not think you know better about anything, because you wouldn't think you knew better about your husband or your spouse or anyone you respected. So, so a child is not going to feel frightened and needing a boundary if they feel close to their mom and dad. They're going to feel frightened if, if mom and dad are just going off and saying, oh, you can just do what you want. I'm going to sit here on my, my machine and forget about you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about close, loving contact, which is also free and respectful. Except in yeah. um, I wanted to ask, yeah. it's a good question, um, what is for all of us to ask ourselves, what when the child puts those walls up, what are they protecting? So in our, in, in our perspective of life and everything we know about ourselves, what are we noticing the child put the walls up? What are they, what, how would we describe what they're protecting? They're protecting their the small self, of the person that they believe. Small to be. self, small self? Small self. Small self, they're protecting a small self. An illusionary self, a mind-made self. Are they? A pure child that comes into the world is protecting their small self? They have a small self? If, if, if they're resisting, they certainly are. No. How old, how old is this child you're talking about? A, a baby, two years old, one year old, three years old. They're protecting their will. That's sure. not a small self, my friend. That's a big self. Well, the that's, will, that's the will the, is that's biology. The, that's, sure. the, that's the soul. Well, They're protecting their inherent feeling their body's knowledge that's coming through. That's right. Exactly. That's right. But so that's it's not the, it's not a small self. No, that is it. The the body and the will and all the things that come with biology are real. Like the child wants whatever that is, but that's not who the child is. The child is the awareness and the consciousness in which that is occurring. There's there's a, a discrepancy here. Yeah. When you incarnate you have, to, you have to think deeper than why you first incarnated. Like there's another, there's another story that goes further. Well, the first story is that you incarnated. Yeah, well, that exactly. So you incarnated. But part of that incarnation on some higher level was a choice. So this goes into a deeper story. Why did you choose that? But there's the need for love, right? I, I'm seeing that when a child comes in, the need for love is so great because they're one with love and it's very confusing to suddenly be incarnating into an illusion. But that's what the suffering is. But you incarnated into an illusion. Mm -hmm. You were pure from the beginning, but that incarnation into an illusion was your higher self making a choice on this incarnation of forgetting. With a purpose. With a purpose. Exactly, so you have to go deeper. I don't, I don't understand why you, what you are protecting and why you are protecting yourself. Well, if, if I believe I'm Jerry, I believe I have needs that Jerry has. I, I have need for respect. I have needs for people to, let's say that. I, and if people say to me, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, you're a piece of shit, what are you, whatever, then Jerry, he, he's upset. Right? So 
everybody has their own little Jerry in there that will be upset <laughs> when when people don't support them or agree with the story that you want to say about yourself. That's that's what's what it's all about. That's why people suffer. It, and and what we tend to do as human beings is we we surround ourselves with people who support our story, who support our vision of ourselves, and who fit with us. Well, me being, being, <laughs> me being born in Germany, I've uh, always felt like being a free child. That's why I ended up in Nelson. And of course, as everybody knows, in Germany, you're always told what you have to do, and you have to be disciplined, and you have to listen to that and listen to that. So did I? Uh, protect myself from that, or, or where is it? The, the I that you think you are isn't. <laughs> so I'm not that free child no. that I finally came no. to announce. So you thought you are, you feel you are, you think you are, but what you are is before your thinking. Again, it's what about so your feeling? And feeling. feeling. What, what if thoughts and feelings <clears throat> are objects of consciousness? So whatever we can perceive or talk about is an object of consciousness. But what we are is consciousness itself. We're not an object. So anything we can find in our thoughts or in our body, as powerful as those feelings and thoughts are, are just emerging and arising in consciousness, which does not change, which is always present. It's like a movie screen go to the theater, you, you're watching the movie on the screen. We are the screen. And if you're watching the movie, it's really exciting and there's shooting and action and a love story and you focus on what's on the screen, but the, you don't even see the screen. But it's, it is what is holding it up. If without the screen, there would be nothing there. And that's what our consciousness is. It is holding everything, but we don't notice it because every, everything else is more exciting. Everything is moving around. Consciousness doesn't move around. The screen doesn't do anything. Yes? Uh, that, you know, what you're describing, I'm, I'm not objecting to what you're describing. I think it's an ideal state. And um, I think it can be attained. Uh, but in, there's a big but there, you know. Uh, in the world, you, by far, and large, by far, the 99.9% .9 are involved in this uh, self thing. You know, that's what I want, what I need, what I have to have, etc. And what I am. And, and even what I am, yeah. But so, you know, I, I, I think in, in moments of, you can reach what you're talking about. But in reality, in the world we live in, and. It's it's just I find there's there's so much um, things going on that are essentially bad, and so you say no judgment, and you don't judge anything, and you won't judge anything, and you won't feel any suffering, but in reality of what we're living in. There's huge suffering, and it's inflicted upon us by others, or we inflict it. So, anyway, that's my comment. How do you how do you how do you square it? You know, how do you how do you function in that realm? I think in your there. mindset. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how do you stop suffering? Um, perhaps can, I just we can, say, can I just say something to what because yeah. I because I can go from there with an example. Yeah, I yeah. So I, I hear what you're saying. We have who we have our, our say our soul. I'll just call it our soul awareness all the time. Okay. Is our soul awareness, and then all these things are going on that are that you're saying are the small self. Um, so even if a ch okay, so children, and I, I have my own, and I've raised many 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 foster kids, and I've worked with thousands of people over 35 years mostly children and teens, and the thing is, we still have a responsibility. For example, if my child is being abused, I'm not gonna go, oh, well, that's not really happening, so I'm not gonna, do, I'm not gonna judge it, it's fine if he's abused, you know. I'm just not gonna do that, because my soul awareness knows in every cell of my body is resonating to protect that child. 
and I know I'm in the play, and I know I'm protecting that child, and there's nothing that's going to stop me from protecting that child, period. Did you hear me say something that would suggest that I would think you would allow the child to continue yes. to be abused? Yeah. That's certainly not what I I, I didn't hear that. <laughs> no, I didn't hear that. <laughs> yes? Um, I, w I wanted to, what came up for me when you were speaking was that perhaps it's A plus B. It's not that we are only a spiritual being, we're also physical beings living in this world. So what you're saying is true and what the opposite is, is also true. We're actually both. And so that's our true state, our Buddha nature, our Christ consciousness, but at the same time we still have to live in this physical world. So maybe that's a way to reconcile it, that we're actually both. There's so many levels and words cannot describe yes. what I'm talking about. <laughs> the attempt to do this is kind of silly in the first place. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, good uh, conversation. Yes. I remember it. Pothead all my life, pretty much, from when I could smoke. Going to, when I realized my 14 years old, 16 years ago, was going to be a big pothead, I cut his allowance. He wasn't too happy about that. He went to steal pornographic movie and rented them to his friend, very engineer. And I went to see you, somebody prepaid some therapy, and you told me, he wants to smoke pot, and he will let him. And I thought you were a very nice guy, but crazy. So I did it and I Thank lost him. That was the beginning of me losing him. And of course he smoked pot and he did what he did. So this book is a long time in the making and I get it and I conquer. And I'm reading the continuum concept where they don't part with this new appendix, this new limb of them, this baby. They only put it down at when the baby is ready. And I took a knife from such a child that was quite pointy, and the mom took the knife from me and gave it back to the child. <laughs> and I thought she was crazy, but she wasn't. I see this child now. There's something, there's something there, and you're brave to attempt to convey that with word, but uh, I get it in the no word zone, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I want that book with the dedicates. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Really, I, wherever I was with any so-called master, we are all masters, as we know. If our inner master is hearing master, they always only laughed when they have seen me. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have seen that, that I was what you are describing. For example, in Steiner School, I would walk on the steps years ago, and they started to sing for me from some roof from some room and I sang to them and we sang to each other therefore we have been resonating of that what you talked about and this was with many beings when we allow when we allow this happen and no one was telling me what you are doing here walking on the steps and singing I said so what it is, it is permitted or not permitted doesn't matter for me. So my whole life, we were walking in between shooting, and I was seeing, as I said uh, last time, that the, 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 the high Hitler person there, that they had been testing us 14 days, and he screamed at me, she have a soul. Therefore, I didn't put my eyes down. And my father was saying, what did you do? I said, nothing. I was just myself. <laughs> and then he told me that I have so. So I am out. And and day after, everything was bombarded and everyone was killed. So that guy, actually, I am still being here. Who was there? And so I, I always have been listening to that nothingness, to be in that only, I was starting to hear when you speak more and more in the sound. And this is a resonance for me, truth. 
inner truth that I don't know where it is, but I hear it in the resonance. So for me, it is all divine joke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, so it is a bit <laughs> we all have a little Jerry, but we all have also a little Hitler and a yeah, little mm -hmm. Dan. I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> it is a joke. I woke up yesterday morning and my hip wouldn't uh, would make me just limp, and I have days like that that last one or two days, and then it fall back in. But yesterday I noticed that, and I said, "Ha, huh, a day like that." Thank you. I accept that. And I forgot about it and it went yeah. within five minutes. So there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the how you how you feel the divine joke and thank you. It brings me so much joy. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I I I'm living on I don't know. Yeah. Um so I like to talk to you and when I like what you were saying about we're living in this world and we are spiritual beings, but we are living in this world and and uh, are well, we? I, yeah, we are. <laughs> Some of them. I, I I feel I am. <laughs> Maybe you're not. I am. <laughs> okay, so um, I I really like the the ancient tribes on this earth, and I think they had brought those two things together and. And um, what I'm getting at is, in many languages, there's an, an array of words for love. And when you start looking into these ancient languages and these, the sounds of vibration and how they're describing love, we're realizing that, I'm realizing that the pain, uh, the, the malice, the hate, the joy, the love, um, the anger, the fear, that they are described in some of these languages as love, all of them. All of them are forms of love, and it is the human experience, and we are living a human experience. And uh, I think that in that acceptance of that, and the acceptance of death, the divine joke and life becomes a lot lighter and a lot more fun, and we become a lot happier. And, and happy is just one of those forms of love. And we're still going to experience pain, and we're still going to experience fear, and we're still going to experience loss. And if we can look at that as a gift, and as, a form of, as another form of love, then it just becomes a much lighter experience. And uh, so, so I, do like, I do like the Buddhist monks who can fly down the Himalayan mountains and levitate, and have mastered enlightenment, and, and one thing that uh, I heard from one of those monks is enlightenment is everything. Enlightenment is life, right, and the acceptance of it. And there's, and there's, and there's no one form of life that does not demonstrate enlightenment. Mm -hmm. like, this is it. Yeah. There's never going to be anything else than this. Mm -hmm. Some fantasized state isn't, this is it. This is as good as it's going to get. But enlightenment is not a continuous uh, situation. It's once in a while you're enlightened and then you're not. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to finish one more thing. Um, back, back to the tribal, back to the really grounded warriors who get things done on this planet and see things for how they are and what's happening and, uh, and really work to change things. Um, those, those, were, those were the people who listened to their willpower. They didn't uh, let anybody around them and what other people were going through subject them to judgment or fear or break, break their will down, just like that little child who puts up walls. They're protecting their spirit. They're protecting their soul and they're <coughs> protecting their will. And they feel what's right when they see a child being abused and they step in and they do something. Mm -hmm. And largely, um, that's in, in this world, if we would, I, from myself, from my own perspective, when we want to really feel fulfilled, it's when we don't shut ourselves down and we show up for life. And th that's what those warriors are doing. That's what those those Maori and Aloha tribes are doing. They're not they're not afraid to fight. They're not afraid to stand up for what's right. They don't believe it's wrong or ugly. It's another form of love, right? So when you see things going wrong, whether it's violent 
or whether or whether it's uh, psychological abuse or or psychological empowerment for profits or anything like that that we have the willpower that we have the strength within our own nervous system the health and the acceptance of life for all it is to actually do something and make this world a better place and when we submit that's when we break ourselves down that's when we shut our own will down that's when we, we when we go into this internal this endless internal infinite dialogue and, 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 and start crashing, right? Because we didn't have it in us to show up for what was, in, what was in our heart and what was in our cells, what was in our body, what our feeling was telling us to show up for. We were afraid to show up for our feeling and show up for this world and show up for the purpose we came in to shed light on the world. I think so Elizabeth we, so, has a reading. So we all have a, so we yeah, all have a choice. I want, I want to speak to the to the will. I, this morning, before I came here, I pulled a rune. I often pull the Viking runes for an event, and um, and I, I pulled one that is perfect for today. I think so. So I'll, I'll just quickly read it. And I, what I pulled was Rado, and Rado is about this soul's journey, and it's all about the will. So it goes like this. This rune is concerned with communication, with the attunement of something that is two sides, two elements, and with the ultimate reunion that comes at the end of the journey. When what is above and what is below are united and of one mind. Inner worth mounts here, and at such a time we must remember that we are not intended to rely entirely upon our own power but rather to ask what constitutes right action. Ask through prayer, through addressing your own knowing, the witness self, the teacher within, the higher self. Not intent on movement, be content to wait. While you wait, keep on removing resistances. As the obstructions give way, all remorse arising from trying to make it happen <laughs> disappears. The journey is towards self-healing, self-change, and union, as Jerry spoke about. You are concerned here with nothing less than unobstructed, perfect union, but the union of heaven and earth cannot be forced. Regulate any excesses in your life. Material advantages must not weigh heavily on this journey of the self toward the self. Stand apart even from like-minded others. The notion of strength in numbers does not apply at this time, for this part of the journey cannot be shared. Another of the cycle runes, Rado, represents the soul's journey and has within it the element of joy, for the end is in sight. No longer burdened by what we've left behind, heavens above us and earth below us and they unite within us to support us on our way and a simple prayer for the soul's journey is I will to will thy will and thy will represents to me the higher self will the super consciousness oh, Jerry I look forward to suffering with you again <laughs> <laughs> so do <laughs> so let me just say for me, I've always had a problem with religion and with any belief system, really, because any belief system is of the mind and can be challenged. And whatever beliefs a person might hold, the opposite of those beliefs are also true at some other level. So to, fo to focus on or to put my, my, my treasure in my beliefs is, uh, doesn't work. It doesn't work to have beliefs of any kind or to focus on mine or mine thoughts as being true. And it's important just to notice the difference between your mind and what you believe and what you are. Mm -hmm. That what you are is that which is holding or supporting those beliefs. But the beliefs come and go. If we change, but what is holding them cannot and does not change. And our safety, our security, our peace comes from identification and remembering that we are that which does not change. We are here right now. All we got to do is 
uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, Dan was talking about energy, and energy can be either a wave or a particle. And it's just, if we look at it, if we put our attention on it, all of a sudden, what was invisible becomes visible. And that same attention, when we meditate, if we sit and we, if our intention is to focus on what our true being is behind our thought, the focus on it makes what is invisible come to life in a way that we can start to experience this invisible beingness. So it takes practice. This is not something you can do in your head. You cannot figure this out. What this requires, if you want to remember who you are, is to focus on it, to, to let yourself go behind your thoughts. And when you feel upset, ask yourself, who is it? For who am I holding these feelings? The other night, I was with my wife, and she, I don't remember what she did or what happened, but I, I found myself getting closed and getting angry and, and pulling away from her. And so what I know, I, the first thing I noticed is that was happening. Second thing I noticed is I, re I recognized this closed down anger place. I've been here before. And then I asked myself, for whom am I holding, for whom am I holding these feelings? Who am I representing by having this anger? realized it wasn't anybody in there. There's no Jerry there holding that. And as I realized that, then I just, the feeling just went away. But when I believed that I was that guy, I would hold, I used to hold that for weeks. That, oh, that was so true, and I was so right to feel that way. And she was such a bitch, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, I just, oh. And that's what this can do. Whenever we suffer, when I remember that there's no Jerry there to, hold, to suffer. How can, how can suffering exist? It cannot exist if there's no separate self. And there isn't one. It's the illusion. We just have to recognize it by focusing our attention on it. Wouldn't you say it's recognizing our human condition? Sure, however. And, I, I mean, that's the way I look at it. I yeah. mean, if I'm going to get so-called enlightened, I have, I have to be aware of my condition the human condition and accept that. Yes. For me, for me, it was also a joke. People were asking me all the time, how are you? I didn't understand it at all. I didn't resonate to it. So by, I usually say, I am. <laughs> and they say, what does it mean? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. Ask your inner self. <laughs> Ask yourself what it is for you, for you. And they said, sometimes it is in the beginning of when I come to put me store and they are still contemplating and following me and asking me questions. Who it is? <clears throat> oh, the children walk behind me. And I said, they, they recognize that I am just I am. I am what I am. That's what, that's that's what, what, what for me it was, for me words in English so it sounds very funny. <laughs> and I think so we I, need I'm certainly... Uh, I think we need another three hours. I am not, they, they, they sometimes come and following me in the store. And the, to know still what I meant. <laughs> and so, so we are standing there between apples and whatever, <laughs> vegetables and, and staring at each other. And I am saying, you just allow yourself to be, to just be. So I, Without I'm, any anything. From, I don't know they call it here personality or whatever the names for it is, but when we are really within ourselves, we don't have anything like that. Uh, the time went by really fast. Too fast. <laughs> Thank you for Which listening. time? Thanks, Thank Jerry. You. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. <laughs>
Okay, with my mom, we ended really abruptly. Does anybody else want to say or ask something before we officially end this? I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Thank you. It's a beautiful morning. Me too. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I could say one sentence to close it up. I had a similar experience as you did just recently where I was <clears throat> went into a very strong reaction. I shocked myself. And then I was working with it that day. And uh, I came up with a question for myself, and it dissolved everything. The question is, is this situation, a person, a threat to who I am? I just had to laugh. I have, to, I have just gotten a really good advice, but to me this wraps all of this together. Mm -hmm. I was told that uh, I'm here to find my soul. No, no, for your soul growth. You moved for here my for soul, soul I, I moved here for my soul growth. Mm -hmm. She couldn't stay in Germany to grow as a soul. <laughs> that's, that's what I explained to yeah. I, yeah. earlier. And that's in a few words to me for everybody was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And one other yeah. thing I would suggest if you want to practice is to notice what your beliefs are. Write them down, like the things that you believe mostly. And notice that they're beliefs. Notice that they're constructed by your experience and by your biology. And notice that you are not what they are. And notice if you have the courage that the opposite of those beliefs are true. Let them go. There's so much, so much belief stuff that we talk about here, all these theories about like incarnation and past lives and the higher self, all of these are ideas. And they're beautiful ideas, but they are objects of consciousness. And what we are, again, is that which those ideas emerge. Everything emerges there. We get stuck in our ideas. That's all I want to say. Thank you again.